as Mike said, we've been doing a lot of work around APIs around the world, uh, focusing on initially heavily on API design and architecture, getting much more heavily into API strategy over the last couple of years, and then most recently, I would say the last year and a half, uh, not even by choice, but being pulled into this whole new world of microservices. So, you know, we, they're inexorably linked together, APIs and microservices. In fact, there's a lot of things that are inexorably linked with microservices. And I think that um, we've come to a point now with this, uh, with microservices where it's become the, you know, the it trend. Every year has its little trend of uh, IT trend. We went through cloud and big data and so on. But uh, it seems to me that microservices has just caught fire in the enterprise. So to start the day off, I want to, I'm going to attempt to come up with a, a one sentence definition of microservices, which is pretty challenging uh, given how the whole thing is, has arisen. So, um, so this is going to walk through, you know, why do people do microservices? What are the principles behind microservices? Getting to that definition and then looking into what are some dependencies and potential pitfalls. Uh, really, to, I'll, I'll touch on some things that will go into much uh, bigger detail uh, as we go through the day, but I just think this is a good way to, to get grounded. When you're attempting to define microservices, it's, it really, I, I've seen this pattern emerge around how these IT trends play out, right? There's companies that do something or, or somebody has an idea, and as soon as two people have the same idea or three people or they all do the same sort of implementation, uh, then people start to pay attention. In this case, I would argue that you know, Amazon has been doing what we're now calling microservices for several years. Uh, Netflix uh, has gone this route, and really they're the ones, I think, more than anyone who have become the, the, the big proponents and, and uh, spokespeople for microservices. Uh, and then some other smaller companies that you'll see a lot of detail around as they share their experiences m with microservices, like Gilt and SoundCloud. So these things are happening. Companies are adopting some new way of building applications or systems, and they start talking about it, and then people start to identify patterns. So in this case, you have Martin Fowler and ThoughtWorks, who's, who he and James Lewis uh, have latched onto it. Maybe they, they were the ones who popularized the term microservices. Adrian Cockcroft, from, uh, who was at Netflix and now is with a company called Battery Ventures. Uh, Sam Newman, who wrote the book Building Microservices. How many people here have, uh, have either read that book or heard of the book Building Microservices by Sam Newman? Okay, so a few hands go up. Um, and then, then once the trend gets popular, it just goes careening off in multiple directions. So now, you know, we have this case where microservices, you have people who are saying, who were immersed in the SOA movement saying, hey, wait a minute, this is just SOA over again, right? And you have people who like the container aspects and the affinity with Docker, and they say, okay, if I just take applications and containerize them, then I'm doing microservices. And then you have DevOps purists who are saying, no, 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 this is all an extension of DevOps. So I think it's helpful to actually take a step back and look at how we got to this point, right? So, you know, if we look at the enterprise IT timeline, um, there are three perspectives I like to look at all together in order to really understand how these changes happen, how these movements happen. So number one is, is what's happening in organizational structure. Secondly, what's happening in architecture and style and patterns. And then third, what's happening in the actual life cycle of how people are building applications. And I think there is an actual thread that we can follow through in all these areas. So late 90s, I'm, I guess I'm getting old now, but you know, late 90s, some of you maybe were just born then, but uh, the, we had the organizational situation where you had these kind of city-states. The web boom had just happened. Um, and then, uh, you know, web was just be web technology, web approaches were just becoming popularized inside the enterprise walls. So as opposed to people just putting their favorite movie list there out on Netscape or whatever, now they're, they're starting to think about how to do things like online banking or provide information about their, their companies. And of course, development very much in a waterfall vein. But What's really interesting to me is, at the turn of the millennium, we had this whole reaction to the web boom. So the web went crazy, everybody got on board, except there was a whole lot of outages, there was a lot of uh, instability in IT environments, uh, and also there was a huge importance played on technology because of the potential it offered with the web. 
So this is really the area where, where or the era where CIOs became extremely popular. A lot of companies started uh, appointing high-level CIOs, reporting directly to the CEO. Uh, you've had centralization of bringing all technology groups together. So as opposed to having these decentralized IT shops around, they were now all centered under a single CIO. Um, this is where SOA was born. So it was under the, under the uh, circumstances of consolidation and centralization that SOA came from. And SOA as a, as a, as a pattern was supposed to be about creating reusable services, a, a much bigger emphasis on saving cost on projects and reuse than what we'll see in the world of microservices. But also around this time, you had more of an emphasis on these frameworks and methodologies. There was the ITIL framework, which was very operationally focused, availability focused. You had CMM, which is this notion of capability maturity model in the enterprise of how good are you at building a, you know, strong and, and reliable applications. Moving into the middle part of the last decade, uh, this was kind of reaping what we sowed with this centralization and movement now. Now it's about being more efficient, it's about being stable, and the mentality is the best way to stay, get uptime, the best way to uh, be available and stable is to not make any changes. And a lot of the, the thinking around that time was be rigid, don't do a lot of change, and that will help you stay uptime. But, but that caused its own problems, because now uh, you've got companies who are, are in a very uh, agile market, and they're not very agile because they're unable to make changes very frequently. There's a lot of dependencies. There's a lot of micromanaging coming down from above. And this, these are the conditions that now set up the rise of agile. So agile manifesto predated this era, but this is when the agile methodology really took off. Then we move into something happened in 2007, 2008. Uh, Steve Jobs went up on stage and announced this, uh, those three innovations, which are actually one thing when the iPhone. And that just kind of blew everything away. Because now you had a whole, everyone was, had tunnel vision for the web, and everything was going along that path. And all of a sudden, this disruptor comes up in the iPhone that changes the game. And it changed it initially in the consumer space, but it really now uh, uh, creates new conditions in the enterprise. So with the mobile following the path of the web, now you've got shadow IT groups coming up again, and you've got business people taking a much bigger stake in the technology. And now those CIOs who had risen up on the prominence of web technology are being viewed as inhibitors by the business because they're not moving fast enough. So now we go, we start the cycle again, and you get these IT city states, which we're now calling shadow IT. Um, and then, but following along that path of agile, we get continuous integration, continuous delivery, and cloud. And now what that does is it says, okay, take this agile methodology, which is all about being fast to market. Now we've got tech, new technology tools we can use, new approaches that we can use to realize that vision. And now in the era we're in here, which I guess we're almost out of if I ended it at 2015, uh, we see a rise of, guess what? Instead of the chief information officer, which rose up with the web, we see this chief digital officer role. We're seeing digital groups, which are amalgamations of uh, business people and technology people. And this is the b large organization's way of saying, we need to move faster on the digital stuff, we need to, need to be consistent, and we know it affects all of the areas of our business. So we're seeing that happen organizationally. We're seeing APIs, which actually were kind of born out of SOA and born out of the, uh, the, the CICD movement for automation, as well as just being born out of the web, now being everywhere and being used for integrating data, integrating business services, and providing the facilities for doing automation and, and DevOps. And then finally, on the lifecycle front, we see the kind of the full realization of Agile where we've got this notion of DevOps culture being baked right into organization. And we're seeing now a move where we were with centralization, which led to the SOA movement. Decentralization is the big buzzword now. So it's, you know, it's better to duplicate than to be, have build dependencies. This is the kind of mindset that we're in now. So uh, the reason I kind of put this up there is to, to help you understand, and maybe you already do, but help you understand how these movements come about, and especially what are the nuanced differences. Because there will be similarities in all these movements, but there are reasons why they're different. And, and the result here is that we've got things now like continuing to, you know, CICD, cloud computing, APIs, DevOps, open source, 
JavaScript, all these things out there that are buzz terms, and, and there's some skepticism, right? I think sometimes when new things come about, everyone who has been, who's had some history in the world of IT says, well, wait, this is just the same old thing again. But, you know, in this case, there are actually real new things that are being delivered, right? What does continuous integration, continuous delivery give us, right? It gives us, instead of being afraid of change, if we want to, if we acknowledge that, yes, change brings problems, change brings downtime, let's not be afraid of it. Let's just get really good at change, right? Cloud, that just means instant provisioning, right? We all remember the, the pre-cloud world of, of having to get your infrastructure set up. It took a long time. That just affected the way that we built our processes. But now we can take away a lot of those uh, barriers. Web APIs, right? I think that's something that's very new about APIs versus some of the old school methods of integration is it's all built around the self-service notion. So making, d eliminating dependencies, increasing scale of integration because now people can do it for themselves. They don't have to call up the, the one person who's been working at the company for 35 years and has the COBOL copy books or whatever that you need to connect to. Um, DevOps, right, is really the cultural realization of this. Open source is something that has grown up, I would say, in, in parallel with the whole agile movement as a very decentralized concept and you know, gives us a real starting point on things. Uh, JavaScript, I mean, JavaScript has now almost followed the way that Java originated, right? Like, I, 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 I'm always talking about history, but I, I'm always amazed how these things follow each other. So when Java first came out, it was, there was a lot of cynicism. Oh, you can't use this language for enterprise applications. You know, what are you talking about now? Now it's the de facto enterprise language, but we've seen JavaScript follow the same path now where I know some people, I think including Martin Fowler, are very cynical about JavaScript being used. The reality is it's being used everywhere. There's new frameworks that are being built, similar to you know, JEE, um, and, and really it's a normalizer for skills. So as we, there's such a hunger for development skills out there in companies. JavaScript is a way, it's a very easy starting point. It's a way to get more developers out of the masses. Um, GitHub, you know, is kind of our social network for, for code, uh, but it's really a connection point for all developers. Containers and Docker, right, it, it's, we're going to be talking a lot more about in, in this afternoon. Um, you know, they're not, con Docker and microservices are not the same thing, but they're very closely linked just because of what containers offer for a, uh, an approach to building applications that's, that's based on very small uh, and, and easily deployable pieces. And of course, so, so with all of that in mind, we now have microservices. And really, I, I've said it's the optimal application style for DevOps, but really what it is is an architectural style that's just suited to its times. Because if this is all the things that we're dealing with, uh, microservices really fits the bill. So let's try again on defining microservices. Take two, right? Is it the architectural realization of DevOps? Is it SOA 2.0? Is it single function container-based application? Is it, what's the, what's the other one? Uh, SOA with bounded context? There's a lot of definitions out there. To me though, if your definition doesn't give away your intentions, it's not that useful of a definition to use because then it's, we just get pedantic about it, right? And I've seen this happen with a lot of other IT movements. We just start saying, you know, we start splitting hairs and, and, and start uh, introducing dogma of the whole thing and we lose sight of why we were doing it in the first place. So I like to think about things by business value. I like to think about what we're doing with, uh, with microservices and define it by its business value. So, uh, in the Sam Newman book, Building Microservices, he lays out seven different uh, value points for microservices. So. Heterogeneous technology, so this is saying you use microservices, now you have the ability to use all different technologies within the microservices. You don't have a dependency on one big language or stack or so on. Resilience, so if you have lots of independent services in your environment, then uh, you're more resilient because if one of them goes down, it's not gonna blow away the entire uh, stack. Scaling, this is one we're gonna see a lot. So this is, uh, this is all types of scaling. So not only can you scale better at runtime and, and have independent scaling of those individual microservices, but you can also scale your development efforts because now uh, you can have less dependencies on teams, you can, get, uh, you can have them working uh, 
more independently. Um, ease of deployment, obviously. Organizational alignment is uh, an interesting one because that really doesn't come from the microservices, right? That really is something that's separate. And, and Mike's going to talk a lot about culture and cultural alignment uh, later on today. Composability, so this is the theory that now you've got these independent pieces. Okay, now you can weave them together in different ways. And then optimizing for replaceability. This is an, uh, I like this idea because now we're looking ahead and saying, um, rather than worry about the, uh, um, worry about having to replace one big thing, it's much easier to just kind of knock away a microservice and put something else in its place than it is to try and port an entire app or migrate an entire application, uh, enterprise application somewhere else. But as you can see, this is a very technological take on the, uh, I guess, organizations in there, which is good. But there's not necessarily hard financial benefits, right? And when we, when we deal with uh, business value uh, and you, you work with the big consulting companies or whatever, they always have quadrants of value, right? And the top two are always, are you adding revenue? Are you subtracting cost, right? And how do we make that equation? So there's actually this interesting article. I'm not sure how many of you saw it, but there was an article on microservices in the Wall Street Journal which I thought kind of interesting. I thought, as soon as I saw that, I said, okay, this is definitely a tipping point for microservices. It's in the Wall Street Journal. But it was written by this uh, venture capitalist named Matt Miller, and he, it's pretty good synopsis of a business breakdown of microservices. So he talks about agility. So that's a higher level concept than what Newman was talking about. But really, that is the ultimate goal, trying to make your, your company much more agile uh, and, and more nimble in dealing with new, introducing new requirements and being able to pivot with the market and pivot with the, with the availability of new tools. Efficiency kind of goes hand in hand with that, but it's from more from an operational perspective. So uh, if agility is about what we're going to do in the future, efficiency is about being better at what we do right now. Resiliency again, you know, we see those, those three pillars. Um, and he, d he did have the guts to say, add revenue. But if you look at the revenue thing, it was kind of derived from other things. So I, I put all these together and looked at trying to break it down into a model, right? So if at the top we have increased revenue and cost savings as those two big buckets, really, you know, those are driven by agility on the revenue side, efficiency on the cost saving side. And then underneath those, we can take all of the different value points and look at, you know, if we pull this lever, what's the ultimate effect going to be? So I think it's very important for us to, uh, Always think about, you know, instead of saying, you know, we're going to do microservices and then stampeding down the path of what does that mean? It means this technology piece and these containers and, you know, these APIs and all. It's more about, okay, why are we doing this? How do we stay focused? How do we make sure that every step we take are going to be contributing to that value? Because quite frankly, if you don't do it right or if you don't do it with that focus in mind, there's a lot of ways that you can actually get worse at these things if you're trying to do something new, right? Or if you're not aligned on, on other areas. But here are, some, uh, here are some stories from the field. I hope you guys can read it at the back. But um, so the top one, uh, Werner Vogels in, in this interview with ACM was talking about their approach to, Amazon's approach to uh, how they build services. And he's talking about scaling their operations independently, maintaining availability, and then introducing new services more quickly without having to reconfigure everything, right? So this is like, this is, I think this is the key value point for microservices, is historically, that approach of kind of the, the idle model or the, the operationally focused model is saying, if you want stability, you can't have very much change, right? Because the thinking was, if you do a whole bunch of change, you're going to actually uh, in introduce more problems in your operations. But what Vogels is saying at Amazon is, hey, we can actually do both. We're actually getting better with our availability due to this architecture that we have, and we're able to introduce things more quickly. So that's the holy grail value proposition of microservices, is to be able to be better at both of those things at the same time. That was from 2006. So I've, I've, I've shared that link on the reading list. It's pretty fascinating if you read that to see what was going on then. And that was where Amazon Web Services was born out of that, uh, that kind of approach at Amazon. Netflix is talking about... Um, microservices and their new approach. And their I think that art, there's, there's a, the blog entry I included here is saying, uh, how do we know where you left off when you were viewing House of Cards? 
But in there, they're talking about using microservices as a new architecture. And really, they're very focused on scale for obvious reasons, right? What's, what are the stats? I think Netflix constitutes something like 25% of all web traffic based on the streaming data that they have. So scale is very important to them. But that's, that's the big emphasis. Now, in this article about guilt, it's in InfoQ, um, Adrian Treneman from Gilt, he's talking about why Gilt went to this microservices architecture. And I love this point that he brought up. Really, in this case, it wasn't about a technology thing so much. It was about reducing dependencies between teams. So they had more of a horizontal structure and they were having trouble introducing things because they'd have to have call too many people at the same time to make changes. By coming up with an architecture that actually isolated things, they were able to re re uh, reduce the dependencies and bring their code to production faster. And then finally, um, there's an article by Phil Calcedo from SoundCloud. I don't think he, I think he might have left SoundCloud. So he's, he's written a pretty, uh, a, a nice balanced article talking about what worked, what didn't work for microservices at SoundCloud. But from a benefit standpoint, they were really focused on getting things out more quickly, reducing lead times. Um, and, and he says, you know, as a startup, they were able to introduce things bang, bang, bang. Then they kind of got this weight as they, as they grew, and that slowed them down. By going to microservices, when they were a bigger size company, they weren't able to get back to being as fast as they were when they were a startup, which is probably not a realistic goal anyway, but it certainly sped it up to a much more acceptable level. So that's kind of the, the benefit statements. But the question is, is there an approach to get there? Like, what do you need to focus on? in order to get there because there are so many microservices itself as a concept has become so broad now. We've got, uh, like I said, even these individual sects of, of interpretations around microservices. But I think common denominators are that if you adopt principles around being modular with how you build your applications or systems, that's an important first step. So modularity is key. Getting aligned with this concept of domains and and then really, I think the piece that's missing in all the literature today is systems thinking. Bec and, uh, but I'm going to go into detail on each of these. But I see this as somewhat sequential. You know, Everybody's trying to be modular. A lot of people are trying to, to go move to domains. And they're struggling with doing things like service uh, boundaries and, and uh, bounded context and all this. But on the third one, I don't think a lot of people are yet really uh, looking at the systems aspect of what you result in when you get microservices. So modularity is an old concept in computer science. We know, right, we're right back to the, to the earliest days. But I thought, I, I read this book, Nature of Technology by Brian Arthur, fascinating read, where he's trying to talk about the, you know, what is the essence of technology, what defines what technology is. But in there is a very powerful quote. Modularity is a te technological economy, what the division of labor is to a manufacturing one. So I talked earlier about we're in this state now. Uh, I, I wrote an article in TechCrunch on it now uh, as well, where we've got uh, so much dependent, uh, so much of the economic growth of the shared global economy is based on digital stuff. And we're building software all the time. Right, so then the demand for software is going like this, and the actual resourcing is not. So, so how do we handle that? Well, modularity is a key to that one, and what he's really saying is to be more efficient, uh, be more modular. So we see modularity in microservices for sure, right? I would argue as much as containers are a common denominator in what we're seeing around microservices deployments, I would argue APIs, web APIs, are even a more, uh, more of a common denominator. A APIs in the microservices context are the things that are going to wire together the microservices. They're the things that are going to expose the actual business services within a, within a system of microservices to the outside world. And they're also the mechanism by which you're doing your deployment and, and automation and, and so on. Um, modularity features in Heroku's 12 factors, and there's a lot of affinity between building 12 factor applications and building microservices. Um, and then this notion of smart endpoints and dumb pipes, which is one of the tenets of the microservices definition that were given by Fowler and Lewis. So you know this notion of modularity within the technology is pretty important. Within the system, right, we have the baseline infrastructure, which now is much more modular with, uh, with cloud. We've got uh, this 
uh, notion of having to have an involvable architecture to make sure that we're resilient to, to future change. And one of the best parts of the Newman book, if you have a chance to read it, he goes into a discussion around uh, something that is, is a very high level concept, but talking about how even from a resource perspective, from a management perspective, when you go to a microservices architecture, you're actually democratizing your environment more. Because in the past, and you guys may have lived this, right, there's, you get some big monolithic application and there's a couple people who are like the go-to people, they own it and everybody else is somewhat subservient to those people when it comes to that application. In the microservices world, there's a much more of an opportunity for ownership of components so that everybody can own a piece of the, piece of the system. But modularity isn't enough. You can't just split things up, because you could split things up to a ridiculous point, right? You could say, okay, I want to build a house, but I just have this big pile of sand now, right? Um, so if you don't have focused modularity, then you may just have a, a, a bigger problem, because now you're going to be dealing with bigger complexity around having all these individual components, and you might run into problems with, uh, with things, building too many dependencies. I talked to, uh, to one company who was looking to adopt microservices, and I think they were at the point of saying, you know what, we're going to take, take our databases and we're, everything that's an entity of the database is going to become its own microservice. And so, and I've seen this written up as recommended approach. And what happens is now, you know, anytime you have to join a table or do something like that, you have to call multiple microservices, you're building dependencies, you're really just uplifting a bigger problem into the new environment. So how do you deal with that? So Eric Evans wrote this book called Domain Driven Design. Um, and this has been a school of thought in software architecture for, I'd say, I think it's over 10 years now, um, right? And, and his thinking is, you know, software is just, you know, the, the, the biggest value proposition of software is its ability to solve domain-related problems for the user. And the concept of domains is really, how big is a microservice? And this is, so, so as I said before, I think everybody's on board with modularity. And I think the easy thing to do with microservices is to say, well, let's just start splitting things up. Let's just start creating uh, container-based uh, components. And then you know, now we're on board. What happens is they take that step, and then they expect to get all the benefits of Amazon and Netflix and everything else, right? There's a, there's a, a lot more to it. So, and I think this may be uh, the next big step for, for or, or, or the big, biggest value step for using microservices is, is landing on the size of the microservices and the scope of the individual microservices. So domain-driven design brings up this notion of uh, bounded context. And what that means is you start to look at your information within a certain scope. Uh, and you might have some overlapping entities. So that example that I gave would be in trouble. Like, customer in a sales context might be different than customer in the context of a call center servicing the customers and so on. And then, you know, a lot of people have been working on adopting microservices and building those microservices around these domains. I think it's, uh, you know, I think Iraqli's going to be talking more about this concept, but then we've already run into some issues with that because there's ambiguity there. So now there was this also notion of uh, command query responsibility segregation, CQRS. There's some really good write-ups on this, uh, Microsoft has some really good resources around this. This is where you start to think about the types of actions that you're going to be taking within a service. So are you just looking up, is it read, and this is probably something as old as the enterprise integration, right? Is read only versus update type services. So, so that's another school of thought that's been built around defining what domains are about. And then there's this jobs to be done framework, which is really, as opposed to focusing inside on the, on the scope of of services or the scope of data, now we actually focus outside on, well, who's actually going to be using these services and start to define things around those tasks. So there's a lot of work to be done here on really coming up with the best practices around defining domains, but it's an extremely important step, um, and, and there are certainly some principles that you can use there. So, you know, microservices really, uh, the question is, right, are they the consequence of domain uh, definition or are they going to be the driver of domain definition? Um, this is the art versus science, so you're not going to get it right the first time. And not only that, but the optimal service boundaries for your microservices today 
might not be the optimal services for tomorrow. And this is actually something that has been stated over and over again in the, in the literature for those who have been on the microservices path for a while. You know, they, and, and they've kind of said, take the baby steps. Don't, don't go that route of going down to the database and trying to pull every single entity and table into its own service, right? Start at a higher level. And that, that brings up an interesting point, right? Because a lot of the, the stuff that we're talking about around microservices is always talking about microservices juxtaposed against monolithic applications. Uh, oh, sorry, one more point on the, on the, on the uh, domain boundaries. Uh, this is a big one, Conway's Law. Everyone, anyone heard of Conway's Law before? This is like all over the industry. What's interesting is Mel Conway himself, he's kind of being treated as this venerable software guy. He's still writing stuff. He's, he just wrote a very interesting blog about how do we make uh, the software more accessible. Anyway, but he came up with this statement in 1967 saying, like, if you design like, any organization that builds a system, it's going to mimic the communication processes of the system. And Mike's going to talk a lot more about that. But uh, what we've seen is everyone says you have to align your organizational structure to fit the structure of those domains, those, the scope of those services, or else you're just going to be persisting the problems that you're trying to get away from. And this is the Fowler uh, imagery around that, which is very simple and, and easy to uh, absorb. But the problem is that these domains that we're talking about are part of a bigger system, right? This is a picture that's not, not rendering the best, but it, you know, when I look at this image, to me it looks like some sort of uh, neurological system or you know, some map of the brain. This is actually a, a digitally generated map of the internet at a point in time, right? These are all the connection points. I'd say the internet is probably the thing that humans have created that maybe mimics the structures of life more than anything else. But ultimately, that's a complex system and infinitely more complex, I'm sure, than what we're dealing with in the enterprise. But the fact is that, that when you have this type of, when we build microservices, when we now say, let's say we, we say we're going to split up this monolithic application, we're going to go and here are the service boundaries we're going to use. I think what a lot of people are ignoring is the fact that you now have a complex system on your hands. Your application before that had some boundaries around it is now a living system. And so a lot of the focus and uh, the, the state of euphoria that we're in right now around microservices is based on this notion of once I have the services and I'm looking inside that box and I'm working within the, 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 the microservice, it's great, it's liberating. I have total control, I've got, I've got my data encapsulated there with my logic, it's great. The problem I, I see coming is that, and we're starting to see evidence of, the, of this from the companies that are well down the microservices path, you, you have to pay attention to the fact that these things are all assembled into a bigger system, right? So here's my, here's my systems quote. Uh, this systematics, uh, systems, I think, I think the latest version of this is called the systems bible. But uh, and it, it's interesting though. Com and, and, and this is considered to be the ultimate work on systems, right? A complex system that works is always found to have evolved from a simple system that works. So if you try and design a complex system from scratch, uh, it, can never be, it can never work. Not only won't it work at the start, it can never be fixed to make it work. So you have to start working with a simple system. Now this would seem to lend credence to this movement that's coming up called the, I'll call it the monolith first movement. So there's a whole, since so many of the stories uh, have, uh, about microservices have come up, have been focused on, hey, we had this big monolithic application, we had all these pain points, so we went to microservices and we started to unbundle the monolith or we started to uh, you know, take pieces of it away. And so there's a school of thought right now in the microservices world that says, you have to start that way. You have to have a monolith before you can do microservices. But that's created a lot of debate. So then there's the counterpoint of, no, you don't. You can start small. I think the key, though, is that, is that last quote, which is you've got to, uh, whatever you start with has to be simple. You, know, you could start with a simple set of microservices. And I think that's, you know, a, there have been documented cases of that as well. But what you definitely shouldn't do is try and uh, come up with some massive map of what your whole environment looks like and try and build that from scratch. Right? The other thing to consider is 
and I'm talking about these complex systems, those monolithic applications that have become a problem have become a problem because they themselves are actually complex systems, right? You might say, well, I've got this big, you know, our big web app is just one application, so it's not as, as complex as all these little microservices. But if you try and untangle the code in a big enterprise application, you know what kind of a complex system you're dealing with, right? It has these system uh, characteristics. So when you're looking at microservices in an enterprise environment, so in the environment that you're working in, and I assume, how, ma how many people are here are starting from scratch building something brand new with microservices? Right. Oh, okay, that's good. A couple, that's interesting. How many are dealing with the scope of an actual application that's already in place and trying to go from that route, right? Almost everybody. So you're not really building a new application, right? You are changing a system. So you're, and when you change systems, you have to be really careful with what you do because we're dealing with the butterfly effect, right? This is the old, if the butterfly flaps its win, wings somewhere, it can change the weather systems uh, halfway around the world, right? Maybe that's extreme. But you get this echo chamber effect, right, where you, when you make changes in complex systems, you might measure and think that the impact of the change is immediate, but in fact there's this follow-on effect and, and you know you make a change and it has this kind of uh, a petering out effect on the entire system. So you have to be really careful about, about how you change those systems. But a good way to deal with change in a complex system is to really focus on the interdependencies between those components and those domains. So rather than just focus on trying to micromanage the whole system, get inside everything, I think really focusing on those boundaries, and once again, just as in the service, service boundary discussion, looking hard at those boundaries is going to get, make you much more effective with how you can make changes within the complex system. And you have to make sure that you're never designing thinking that you will be done at some point, right? Because a complex system is a living thing. We were having a big discussion about this last night, about how, uh, how do you deal with um, versioning in these environments where something is always changing, right? And so you have to make sure that, and in fact, at one point, I think we were even talking about design for disposability. Design it knowing that it's gonna be blown away in three years, because that's just the trajectory that we're on in the IT world. And then there's this uh, system control concept. Um, so that's Roy Fielding, this is somebody that we all uh, hold, hold dear in the API Academy, obviously. Uh, he's the uh, uh, one who, in his PhD dissertation, came up with the concept of REST as an architectural style. But I think that if boundaries are an important part when we're looking at these complex systems, and that kind of naturally leads to APIs, you know, a lot of the stuff that he's written and a lot of the foundational principles of REST really apply here to dealing with these complex systems of microservices. And he said REST emphasizes evolvability to sustain an uncontrollable system. I think the statement he made after that, this is at a recent presentation, was um, if you think you, can, you control the whole system, then don't bother uh, arguing about REST. And uh, he, you know, he kind of baited the audience with that one, and everyone jumped on it and said, oh, okay, well, I, you know, I control the system, so I don't need to worry about REST. He was actually baiting them because nobody controls the system entirely, right? The system controls itself to a degree, but you can influence the system, right? You can monitor the system. You can be aware of what's happening in the system, so as we deal with these complex systems, we need some analogies. You can always, almost think about how, you know, if we think about some of the most common complex systems we deal with, like, uh, like the economy or you know, the economy as an example, right, financial markets. You can't go in and just change things in there because you, you don't understand how everything works. But certainly policies put into place, different enforcement mechanisms can have an influence over those. So that's the type of, I think, I think, uh, essence of what I'm saying here is I've seen a lot of developers and engineers really drive the microservices movement, which is great. I've seen a lot of enterprise architects reacting to that drive, looking to understand what's happening in the microservices world. There is a huge role for architects in the world of microservices to take this systems thinking, take that mantle, and and help to start getting ahead of some of the problems that will arise if the system is left to its own devices. Because we've already seen cases, I think there was an article published yesterday talking about behind the scenes at Uber, which would, you know, I, I think they've, they've openly declared them a microservices shop. 
But you know, Uber's environment, and I think uh, we had some discussions with them where, where they've just started building all these microservices, but they can't keep track of them. So they just keep building new ones because they don't know what's already in the environment. And I think that's going to become a very common problem, right? It's this initial phase of, of microservice adoption, but you can very quickly come to the problems of the future. So I think there's a big role for architects to get in there and start influencing those systems, but not in the way. One of the problems that we had in the SOA world is the architects, it was an architect's dream because they felt like they had total control and, and you know, they had the hammer and anyone who didn't follow suit would get the hammer. And what happened is there's a lot of places to hide and, and a lot of places for passive resistance in the enterprise. They were, people just went around them. So you know, this, this kind of influential uh, governance is I think a, is going to be important in microservices world. So in order to really tune the system and understand the system, I think a, a key focus should be on shortening the time between uh, collecting the data and analyzing it and taking action. So the smaller, smaller changes that you can identify and introduce are going to be more effective in a system than trying to do large aggregate changes because that will have massive uh, and potentially dangerous effects. All right, so let's try and define it. What are microservices? Well, as I said before, it's very important to include the intentions in the statement. So we can say the pedantic definition, let's say, an architectural style for building an application as a network-based system of modular services organized by business domains, take a breath, in order to improve the application's evolvability, deployability, composability, scalability, resiliency, and replaceability. If we don't keep those things in mind, and if the steps that we're taking in the microservices world aren't helping us on those requirement areas, then we're probably stepping into some uh, doo-doo. And uh, an important thing, maybe should have been a preface, but I, I want to uh, throw it up here is, again, going back to, uh, the Fowler did another article on prerequisites. He included five of these things. So if, if you don't have cloud in order to do very fast deployment, if you don't have a continuous delivery mentality, if you don't have DevOps culture, uh, if you don't have system management, so I think he, he just said monitoring. I threw in system management. And if you don't have uh, APIs, then you know, you're going to be in trouble with microservices. Containers is an interesting one because the question is, is it a prerequisite or is it just a tool? I think there's enough, uh, enough cases without containers to say it's not necessarily a prerequisite. But again, I think the way, the way he put it was, uh, you know, you have to be this tall to ride microservices or something like with, the, with the amusement park sign, right? There's probably, what, there, there, nothing's black and white, so pro probably everyone's going, oh man, I'm, I don't have a DevOps shop or I'm not, you know, we're, we're not fully moved to cloud infrastructure and so on. Obviously, these are statements of intention and, and you know, extreme statements, but they're important things to keep in mind because it, you do need to have some conditions in order to make it successful, or at least be aware of what you don't have because it can cause you problems. And so what have we seen around pitfalls? And actually, Vijay, uh, who's in the room, wrote a great article for InfoQ on, uh, on lessons learned around microservices. Uh, I've included the link in the, in the reading list as well, but talking about where you can get into trouble. Um, and, and some of these, I, I, I may have added a few or changed some names, but it was a really good starting point. But I think if we get overly focused on just the technology bits, like we get so excited about Docker that we think that's microservices, or you know, we, we found a new reason to introduce uh, RabbitMQ in our environment, and so we're gonna go do that, you lose sight of the benefits, you lose sight. You might do some, some interesting things, but are you really on the path to bringing success from this path? Right? Ignoring the prerequisites, so defying the, the conditions for success, a problem. I think not having a real conscious focus on how you're defining service boundaries uh, is a problem. Overlooking the system, so forgetting that you're now creating a complex system, problem. And at the same time, thinking that you have complete control over the system and trying to control it that you might, the way you might control a, a, a simple application also get you into trouble. And of course, boiling the ocean. So trying to start with, as I said, to build the entire uh, ideal utopia microservices architecture for your company, it's not gonna work. 
So just to bring it all together, right? I think having a historical context from where microservices came from and understanding the, the conditions and where we are is helpful because it will help you not just zero in on just specific pieces of microservices, but will help you to try and influence the changes around that are going to be uh, important for your ultimate success. Keeping those business goals clearly in mind. You may have, you may not have all those goals, right? You may have particular pieces that you're really focused on. Zero in on those. Look at, you know, all the changes you're making. Just because you read the Netflix story and it sounded great, and you, you know, you don't have to follow their uh, their story to the hilt because you might find a, a story that resonates more closely with your business value, right? You may not. Maybe you don't have the scale of, of Netflix's uh, traffic and, and microservice world. Know where the benefits are coming from. So I've seen a lot of write-ups around, you know, hey, here are the benefits of microservices. And then when you look through it, you know, 75% of them are actually benefits of the methodologies that preceded microservices. Like, you know, that's, you're getting that from DevOps, you're getting that from continuous integration and so on. So really understand, you know, am I, am I really getting the benefit that I need out of what I'm trying to do? and not just focusing on modularity, right? Not just saying, well, we're gonna split a bunch of stuff up and that'll bring these benefits. The benefits only come if you do the, do the service boundaries and, and understand the system. And then don't shy away from the hard problems because they're much easier to solve earlier on or you can get ahead of them earlier on than if, you're, than if you all of a sudden inherit this big complex system of, uh, and you've just persisted the old integration spaghetti problem by having a new architecture for it, right? Get ahead of it, understand the business domain, understand how things are being used, and design and manage the system. And so here's a, here's a uh, part of the reading list, some of the resources I had. Um, we have a bigger list that we're sharing on that GitHub page that Mike uh, showed earlier. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks.